Welcome back after the tea break. We are now going to the next special lecture of the day. I request Prabhat P. Ghosh, Director Adri, to kindly chair the session. We also have with us Sri Ranjit K. Patnaik, Professor, S.P. Jain Institute of Management and Research, Mumbai. Now I'll hand over the session to Professor Ghosh. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, friends, again. Uh, we are in the probably penultimate session, and we are going to have a lecture on an alternative approach to assess the state finances in India, Indian federal structure by Professor Ranjit K. Patnaik. Uh, Professor Patnaik, I'll give you a brief introduction. is presently a professor at SPJ Institute of Management and Research in Mumbai, Prior to joining SPJI IMR, he was Dean at IMT Hyderabad and Professor at KJ Sumaya Institute of Management and Research. He has worked with the Reserve Bank of India from 1984 to 2009. He has done his PhD from IIT Bombay. His PhD dissertation was on budget deficit measurement, analysis and management. He has been a resource person in several RBI, Government of India and State Government Committees. He has widely published on fiscal issues in many journals. With these words, I invite Professor Patnaik to make his presentation. Uh, at the outset, uh, I thank uh, the organizers and particularly Dr. Govind Rao, my association with him for the last 30 35 years. He sent me a mail, and uh, I was just working with this uh, paper. So I thought uh, I should come and uh, share my views. It is a little uh, revolutionary, and I am taking a U-turn in my approach to analyze state finances. Let me give a background uh, uh, of this. You see, uh, as Dr. Reddy, my former boss and guru yesterday said, Reserve Bank is a full service central banker. It is not a monetary authority. And I was coached by Dr. Reddy on the state finances. And I will show with my figures, and Professor Govind Rao is here, the 14th Finance Commission did a human service to these Bimaru states, as we call it, giving them large amount of tax devolution and uh, grants. Let me tell you, Honorable uh, Deputy Chief Minister yesterday said, we have not gone for market borrowing. That is precisely because the devolution they have got from the 14th Finance Commission is very, very high. I'll give you the figures, the alternative concept what I am discussing today. Friends, I wanted to uh, make you this point very clear. This is the objective of the paper. Before that, I have to discuss with you. When you analyze state finances, state finances, unlike the central finance, is guided by constitution, constitutional factors, and institutional factors. The large expenditure needs of the economy are fulfilled by the state governments, not by the central government. Particularly last two days, the priority on health, uh, discussion, agriculture, rural development, whatever, name any expenditure, it is to the state governments. And the state finance secretary has a major role. When in the younger days, we used to say finance clearance. Nobody said health secretary clearance 
or rural development secretary clearance or agriculture secretary clearance it is a finance clearance so finance secretary's job is extremely important job in the state government so this paper is in fact not from the angle of rating agencies not from the angle of multilateral institutions like imf not from the angle of world bank it is from the angle of budget officer and state finance secretaries so how they will analyze their finances that is the objective so friends this is the objective of the paper a true picture of state finances does not emerge with the existing fiscal rule with fiscal deficit rule and debt rule this could be beneficial for rating agency or imf world bank but finance secretary does not get any advantage rather he is put into disadvantaged position once you tell him that make your fiscal deficit 3% of your gsdp he engages himself to make it 3% beg borrow or steal so what i have done in this paper the structure of this uh, paper is i have flagged this august gathering the limitations of fiscal deficit then i will go to the analytical framework for the alternative concept i have done and then i will take you through the only one year i have done that is 15 16 as an experiment so i am i will be doing this for a longer time period series then i have left some issues for discussion now friends fiscal deficit this definition is a net concept it is a net borrowing of the government here i do not know how many of you are aware of the budget process budget parameters total expenditure minus revenue deficit this investment adjusted something like that i am not going to nitty gritty then the expenditure part is extremely important expenditure is net expenditure the repayments are not taken into account here it is assumed that borrowings simultaneous borrowing and repayment will take place and the state government always has the capacity to borrow from the market to repay it may not be may not happen and it there are evidences of state failures also so the point what i am making here is we have to have a different concept than fiscal deficit second fiscal deficit a large chunk is market borrowing i working in the reserve bank of india for nearly 5 to 7 years i handled two functions of reserve bank as a banker to the state government and debt manager of the state government i know the constraints the finance secretary do have i i have not sat in that hot seat but i have advised them how to handle ways and means advances and overdraft and how to enter the market what time this is my personal experience with the state finance secretaries now next last session the speaker talked about public policy i would like to introduce public policy has become a very buzzword these days public policy fiscal deficit doesn't convey anything of public policy it is only liquidity management if you see foreign finance commission they have not specified anything they just say central fiscal deficit state fiscal deficit this is the fiscal deficit keeping in view the financial savings of the economy and the fi 14th finance commission again they got rid of the 12th finance commission and 13th finance commission recommendation of incentivize the state government to lower or maintain fiscal deficit with 3% this is a good gesture from the finance commission i do not know what the 15th finance commission will do second aspect we have 
plan expenditure and non plan expenditure the committee and the government of india has done away with this so what will happen to the state finances should they continue with the plan and non plan what will happen to the finance commission should they go ahead with plan revenue deficit grants these are the questions with the 15th finance commission and most of the state budget they are still going with the plan non plan expenditure classification with the planning commission abolished how the plan component will be taken care of we i do not know so this is the major uh, stress on the finance secretary of a state government so what i have done is i do not know how many of you are aware of the consolidated fund borrowing and public account borrowing fiscal deficit has two component consolidated fund borrowing and public account borrowing in the public account we have provident funds reserve funds deposits and many reserve funds deposit they do not have the interest component these are intra governmental transactions but included in the fiscal deficit this is another limitation so the point what i am making here is now what are the stress factor on the finance secretary the budget year if i have to design how i will design the budget of a state government this is a really difficult task so we have to first take into account the golden rule the go good olden days the golden rule was total expenditure is equal to total receipts and if there is a deviation this deviation could be handled taking a cash recourse very temporary from the rbi that is called wage and means advances so keeping that golden rule into account i have to flag to this august gathering the constraint of a state finance secretary the first constraint is finance commission award in terms of share in central taxes many uh, state uh, experts they say this is my right and according to the constitution i must get this the second uh, constraint is non statutory grants of course share in central taxes and statutory grants constitutionally is given but non statutory grants is not constitutionally given it is at the discretion of the central government we will see bihar because since i am give, giving talking to the how that non statutory grants part has evolved then the loans from center i would like to recall that with the 12th finance commission the loans from center plan component has gone 12th finance commission advised that state government should go and borrow from the market another thing a little bit tricky state governments cannot go, go and borrow abroad so they are prohibited by the constitution even in the domestic market they have to take the permission of the central government how much they will borrow so with this constitutional constraint and the institutions involved are central government to some extent finance ex uh, commission financial market and reserve bank of india my submission to this august gathering is fiscal deficit doesn't convey anything about this constitutional and institutional factors keeping this in background i will now take you through what i am suggesting expenditure is given and it is a political process in the budget making process as i understand from many many finance secretaries and uh, dr rao and dr reddy expenditure is a political process it is determined by the political bosses resource is a technical process bureaucracy particularly the finance secretary handles it then 
there is a gap. So the first construction is, I have said this is basic resource gap. Deficit is negative. Resource gap is a positive concept. So let us be positive. So the resource gap I have constant on resource B BRG that is the basic resource gap 1, basic resource gap 2, basic resource gap 3. And uh, in the same resource requirement, the central transfers and borrowed resources, we will have to see. Then I have calculated fiscal dependency and fiscal stress. Finance Commission also calculates their own way, fiscal stress, interest payment, revenue receipts, but I have done little differently. Please carefully permit me to uh, explain to you BRG1, basic resource gap 1. Total expenditure given, revenue expenditure plus capital expenditure. And uh, friends, here the expenditure, not like the fiscal deficit in uh, expenditure, repayments of central loan and market borrowing are included. So if you see the total expenditure in my concept is higher than the total expenditure of the fiscal deficit. I'll come back to the figures. So what is happening? To total expenditure minus own tax revenue plus own non-tax revenue. You have a resource gap. You have a resource. You have a total expenditure that is your need. Resource is the capacity. We listen to state capacity. I raise a question whether the state capacity is fiscal capacity. So this is the fiscal capacity. The fiscal capacity is your own resources and your own non-tax resources. Then you have a gap. This gap, how do you are bridging as your journey of budget making process starts. Then you have net public account borrowings such as provident funds plus recovery of loans plus disinvestment proceeds. So your own tax, own non-tax, net public sector, public account borrowing plus recovery of loans plus disinvestment, this becomes your basic resource two. And total expenditure minus this, you have a basic resource gap two. Then the finance secretary moves. So finance secretary say takes then the share in central taxes, statutory grants from the center with this. Then you have the basic resource gap three. Uh, sorry, resource three, total expenditure, basic resource gap three. This is the most important concept. What happens here when you take out total expenditure minus basic resource gap three, then you have the basic resource gap two. What does this, how do you finance this? You will finance this through non-statutory grants from the center. No control, the state government have. Market borrowings, no control, the state governments have. And also ways and means and overdraft, it is not a financing item. But if you have a cash deficit problem, you can go for that. <coughs> and this resource is not financing deficit. I would like to flag. State governments have been disciplined with the ways and means and overdraft. They have a formula based. Those who have worked with the finance department, they will come to know. We did that. Uh, I was with uh, RBI then, Dr. Reddy, PPR Beetle. PPR Beetle is a great state budget expert, 12th finance, 10th finance commission member and finance secretary and planning secretary of Andhra. So that is now formula based. Central government has no discipline in ways and means advances. They have no discipline anywhere and so also no discipline in ways and means advances. RBI annual report says, I have no more in RBI. RBI annual report says 2017-18 they were in WMA for 106 days and overdraft, can you believe the figure? 82,000 crore. 
So this is the fiscal discipline of the central government. So they want surplus. Whatever money RBI also you give besides your WMA. Central state governments are disciplined with WMA. They are with constraint and disciplined. Yesterday Gupta presented the deviation fiscal marksmanship. I did fiscal marksmanship. Central government is a pioneer in fiscal slippage. And there is a competition now between the central government and state government for fiscal slippage. And so also higher fiscal deficit. That apart, let us now see the figures. So this is the stress factor. Then what I did? The BRG, the basic resource gap, you see the, the, the finance commission, the financial market, the central government, the RBI, the finance secretary has to handle these four. Besides the constitutional constraint, besides the constitutional concept of higher expenditure everywhere, rural development, health, agriculture, what not, you know, everything the, center, the state government has to go, do. But the central government announces many schemes which they are not under their purview of announcement. Anyway, that's a separate thing. Now, what I have done after arriving at the BRG gap, if you take the ratio of BRG1 to total expenditure, you have a fiscal dependency. FDR, I have called it. Then we have uh, FDR1, FDR2, FDR3. Then there is a fiscal stress. Fiscal stress is the basic resource gap 1 divided by basic resource gap 3. That means the three elements of the budget, market borrowing, non-statutory grants, and uh, third item is, uh, I'll just come back in the figure. So these are the fiscal dependency, they have, they have gone about it. So I will just, uh, I'll keep this. I have not, uh, I have done little f exercise since yesterday we are told the budget deviates from the revised and accounts, I have no faith in budget and revised accounts. So let us take the accounts figure. So in the accounts figure, latest available is 1516. So there what I got, and I have no faith also in state GSDP. Because there, there is a problem that is not market price, that is factor cost, so many, so many things. But one can normalize that. That is not an issue. So what happened? I have a figure. Total expenditure of all states in 1516, 24,47,000 some odd crore. The BRG1 is 10 lakh crore. BRG3, I'm just rounding up. BRG3 is, thir two is 13 lakh crore, BRG3 is 18 lakh crore. So, friends, the remaining is nearly 5 lakh crore or 6 lakh crore, that is the constraint or stress. They have to get through market borrowing, they have to get through loans and advances from center, which is a very small amount, and non-statutory grants from center. So I did this exercise for Bihar. Let us see how the Bihar has moved. I have, I have nine states, but I am not getting into the nine states because I don't want to take you through the figures. So what? Yes, sir. I will take two minutes. So what happened in Bihar? The total expenditure of Bihar, in my definition of expenditure, 1 lakh 12, 13 thousand crore. Revenue component is nearly 83,000 crore and capital component is 28,000 crore. The gap, look, this is important. The BRG1 is 84 or 85,000 crore. BRG2 is 80,000 crore. And if you come to BRG3, it becomes 18,000 crore. How? How this has come? 
this is precisely because 48,000 crore is SCT. That is uh, finance central tax uh, transfer, devolution. And 16,000 crore is non-statutory grants from center. So the need for market borrowing does not arise. So the government claims that we have our debt is low, fiscal deficit is low. But the stress factor, tomorrow, suppose you don't get this amount of non-statutory grants, how do you are going to handle? So giving this, I will just put these figures with the discontinuation of plan and non-plan revenue expenditure, how basic resource gap will be helpful as, a non, as an alternative for non-plan revenue deficit grants. Extremely important. So the finance secretary needs to look at this. Fiscal deficit and debt have limitations to examine the state finances. How basic resource gap, fiscal dependency ratio, fiscal stress ratio will analyze the state finances in a more meaningful manner. Do you think it is analyzes in a more meaningful manner? How the resource gap as estimated taking into account the three variants will help 15th Finance Commission for making estimates of resources. Another issue we have to see the ob objective is horizontal and vertical balance issues with the Finance Commission can it address. So these are the issues for discussion. I am just working on this and uh, with the data time series I thought I will I came to share my views that uh, precisely I am writing a paper on design thinking and public policy. If you have to design this alternatively, how you are going to design? Inciting with the finance secretaries, I have done that work. They said, I have come with some finance secretaries I have met, particularly in Maharashtra. So, they have <laughs> they have appreciated this. So this is what I wanted to say and thank you for your patience hearing. Thank you very much. I love to have your questions. Can I sit here and yeah, no, please, please sit. Friends, uh, quite often you get papers when you get impressed because of the meticulous nature of the paper or depth of the paper or comprehensiveness of the paper and so on so on. So. I am impressed by Dr. Patnaik's paper, not in any of these, but in terms of simplicity. Uh, many of the concepts that has used to use on a day-to-day -day basis, but the way he has reorganized those concepts to get this BRG1, BRG2, and BRG3 are uh, very illuminating. I think many people would find it useful. With these comments, I open the floor for any questions that you might ask to Professor Patnaik. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Ranjit, uh, uh, the issue that I see is one of moving between macro uh, and theorems about fiscal and so on that we understand and state level uh, finances about which none of these theorems might apply. So, for example, when you talk about fiscal uh, at the macro level, you have the idea of balance, uh, surplus, deficit and so on. And then you have the golden rule, which is really something that you compute in present value terms, looking at projections of surpluses and deficits over time. Uh, and given the fact that the government at the center is free to choose both on its expenditure side and income side in principle. Now with regard to the states that I see it, the way you've described it, there's almost no discretion, no choice. The only choice that I can see came up in the earlier discussion with, in Bihar with the case of revenue and capital expenditures where they made the very bold decision of going ahead with capital expenditures and cutting down on wages and salaries and so on. But other than that, from what I gather, there is no choice whatsoever, uh, certainly not with regard to what is coming in from the center. If that is the case, you're going to live with the basic resource gap forever. It will always be positive, right? So the question now of equilibrium and balance comes in. So it's, if it's, uh, there's probably no meaning to balance ever coming in. Uh, at best, you have uh, matters of stress. So beyond a certain uh, level, you begin to worry because the ratio is a little out of whack. But, uh, but uh, uh, 
there can't be a golden rule here, there can't be equilibrium here, there can't be balance over here. So is that a fair uh, statement to make about the difference between macro, that's central, central and states? Yes. Ranjit, uh, I don't think I have understood what you want to say. Okay, I mean, I think it's better for you to put them in terms of, uh, you know, clear algebra and send it and then we can react to that. However, there are a couple of things that I want to put across. One is in your scheme of things, as you mentioned, expenditure is a political process. You know, it's not an open-ended scheme. If it is completely a political process, then I, there are no limits. The point is there is something called a hard budget constraint that every government will have to face up with. And that is given by the available resources. Right? Now, so obviously, you say that that is a political process, revenue is a technical process. Now, even when you are talking about taxable capacity, the taxable capacity, I mean, are you really talking about a frontier capacity or are you talking about an average capacity? What are we talking about? You know, I mean, you know, you can say that this is the maximum that you can get. Or you can say that on an average, this is what you can get. You know, that's, you said these are very different things. And then on the basis of the existing thing, you want to go about computer thing. I mean, you know, I mean, existing expenditure is not, I mean, it is not given by a political process. Ex existing expenditure is constrained by the, the, the system that we live in. You know, let us understand that. Now, as far as uh, the whole issue of um, fiscal deficit numbers are concerned, the volume of, broadly the volume of borrowing that you are talking about. In my view, this is an important thing because the accumulated, ultimately this adds to the debt. And when it adds to the debt, ultimately there is an interest that you have to pay. And ultimately, interest has to be paid by the revenue that you have. And what is the amount of money that you are I mean, going to have at, the, at, a, at a particular point of depends on the, how much of interest payment that you that the reason why we talk about the primary deficit. I think you will have to make a much more serious case. And, you know, as I said, I don't know what is really, I am sure you are a very, you know, you are a person who has worked in this area for a long time. But I think you need to, you know, put it across very clearly in a convincing manner uh, to be able to convince me that I have to borrow your BRGS. <laughs> Thank you. Friends, uh, I could have taken more questions, but you are slightly behind time. So we'll, Professor Patna, I could respond to the questions. If anyone else has any comment, you can discuss it personally afterwards. Please, President uh, work. <clears throat> first, let me answer uh, Dr. Rao. I knew these uh, reactions, response. Because we are prisoners of our existing thoughts. Uh, look, uh, fiscal deficit, revenue deficit, and primary deficit. The purpose is the first one, fiscal deficit, BCS cycle of deficit debt, hard budget constraint you have. Primary deficit is sustainability. Revenue deficit is the savings of the government. These are well known. I'm not uh, saying that what I am giving is a substitute. What I am giving is a complement. So I am not saying that you don't calculate fiscal deficit, revenue deficit and primary deficit. I am saying when you are doing a budget, <coughs> please follow a budgetary process with the basic resource gap. That will be helpful. And uh, on the, uh, uh, let me clarify, if I have not clarified, when I said expenditure is a political process, the finance secretary gets, when he takes, he, the political bosses says, increase your budget to 10% or 15% in that case. It is the finance secretary who has to convince there is a hard budget constraint because my resources are not commensurate with the, this much of expenditure I can take. So in that context, I uh, introduced by saying, that it is a political basis. I am not deferring that there is a hard budget constraint. If hard budget constraint would not have been there, we would not have gone for fiscal rule or fiscal deficit uh, constraint. Then thirdly, on the, I am not making any, in the BRG, 
I am not making any qualitative statement on that how the tax efforts, how the tax capacity, these are all done. What I am saying here is follow a budgetary process. The budgeteer should understand. Don't give a hard budget constraint and ask the budgeteer to give you a 3% ignoring all budgetary process. And uh, sir, definitely I will uh, send my complete paper to you once I did that. And uh, definitely you will agree with me at a later stage, I know. And uh, at this stage I am little uh, temporary. But if you recollect, sir, I will take just 30 seconds. Yeah. If you recollect, sir, uh, has, when you organized a seminar 15 years back or 20 years back in Bangalore, uh, and you invited all of us from Reserve Bank, and we went there and Hashiv Dhruvu, uh, that time I introduced own deficit, if you remember in the state budget, he said that how can this be own deficit, state government's own deficit concept, and you protected me. Uh, from all the criticisms there, okay, yes, because your own tax revenue, own non-tax revenue and total expenditure has to have a own deficit. So from that own deficit, I have developed this basic resource gap. We have discussed this earlier and uh, because of the time constraint and all, I have not developed this and uh, my objective is uh, to get into this. And on uh, Romar, from your question, uh, my uh, submission is uh, both are macro, but the macro disruption comes from the central government, not from the state government. The macro disru disruptions of inflation and growth, that is a central government issue. The state government gets whatever the central government inflation they give. The state government does not have any role to do that. And uh, again, on the um, state governments and central government, if you look at that, the whole Finance Commission uh, terms and reference is given by the central government. I do not know before that any state, only the after the Finance Commission is constituted, they come and discuss. And uh, in the morning, uh, Dr. Rao clarified on the forest grant. So, 13th Finance Commission, and uh, 14th Finance Commission, there is a difference. No line government, sorry, line department represents themselves in Finance Commission discussion. Govind Rao sir can bail me out on this. It is only the Finance Department. I had some inciting I did for my design thinking uh, paper and uh, linking it to this. So the point here is the stress of the Finance Secretary is enormous. And uh, if uh, Mr. Ghosh permits me that uh, besides I will send uh, him the paper, I would like to associate with your center to do sure, more sure. work on this. And, you are, uh, you are most welcome. Like, uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. We thank you, sir, for the lecture. Now may I request Dr. Sunita Lal to kindly hand over a moment to Professor Patnaik. We also thank Professor Ghosh for chairing the session. Moving on to the next lecture of the day, may I request Sri Arun Kumar Mishra, IAS, Additional Commissioner, Department of Commercial Taxes, Government of Bihar, to please come to the dais and conduct the session. May also request Dr. Sachidananda Mukherjee, Associate Professor, NIPFP, so ki kindly come to the dais. I now request Sri Mishraji to kindly introduce the speaker and conduct the session. Thank you. distinguished guests and luminaries such as Dr. Rao and Dr. Daz and all the others. I am, uh, I am first of all, I am, uh, I am not an economist. So I am almost entirely out of place here. But this is a session on GST 
which I have been doing for the last 10 years maybe and uh, which I have been taught by Dr. Rao and even Dr. Mukherjee. Dr. Mukherjee has done some pioneering work in uh, trying to assess the size of the informal economy in the country which is a very difficult task. But of late he has been doing a lot of work on GST and doing a lot of writing on GST. So he's, uh, he's aware of how or he's up to date with how things have gone under GST. So now I'll hand over to him. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Adri, for inviting me. And thank you very much to all of you for keeping your patience to listen to us. And this is one paper that we have just completed and is a uh, co-authored paper with Dr. Kovita Rao. So this is the structure of my presentation as Professor Dasgupta yesterday mentioned that at present we have just passed the five quarters of introduction of GST. It's not the right time to do an elaborate exercise on GST, but this is a first kind of what kind of uh, things are going on for the last five quarters. I have tried to assess that thing in line with some of the papers that international paper that I put up in Tesari Australian government. So first I will like to address the issues related to what is the impact of GST on economy, mostly on our growth and mostly demand side and the sectoral aspect of growth, inflation and tax administration, tax compliance and also some issues related to state and union uh, finances, mainly the revenue side, how it has impacted. It's a very preliminary analysis and I hope that this kind of findings that whatever I have found in this paper may not stay and I like to see that it should not stay for another say another two or three quarters or another uh, say by in the next year the scenario will completely change. With that note, I want to start. So first of all, the internal, international experience says that, and the experience is that the immediately after the introduction of GST, the GDP growth falls for two to three quarters, and after that, it picks up. And the second thing is that inflation also goes up, and after that, the, it goes down. I'm not going to details in the why it is happened because the thing is that when the GST is introduced and most of the countries if you see GST is introduced in a high growth scenario when the growth rate is very high but we introduce the GST in a very low growth scenario. So from that angle that Indian GST and the other country GST is different and Indian GST is completely unique because the federal structure even the Australia and other countries they have we have double uh, tax uh, administration and is a destination base, is a harmonized kind of system and for several features of the GST is unique and that I have written in one of the papers why it is unique. And second thing on inflation because there will be so much of price correction, supply chains management and the logistics aspect and for that the price changes happen and within uh, one or two or three quarters the price stabilizes and there will be less volatility in the price case. And th the third uh, thing is that, that uh, I want to mention that the GST and the other kind of complexities that we have bought for after the GST revenue neutral rate estimation, whatever happened, the setting of the tax rates, administration side, compliance issues, that is beyond the control of uh, any kind of policy uh, academician like us. It was to totally taken over by someone else. I, I don't want to comment on that. So with that, I want to introduce that what was the experience of Australia? Australia introduced the uh, GST in July 2000 and it is not only the GST, they introduce a package of reforms with the indirect, uh, with direct taxes also, they cut the personal income tax 
and they gave several other provisions so that the impact of GST will be moderated so that they could have a level playing field with the direct and indirect taxes. So within two or three quarters they picked up, this. so if you see that the next quarter they had a huge shortfall then they picked up and the picking up of the Australian uh, GST and the GDP growth was mainly contributed by the Sydney Olympic. If you remember there's a huge construction of capital investment and that thing that helped a lot. Apart from that the direct tax uh, kind of incentives they give. So with that, that uh, what is happened in the Indian GDP growth scenario? If you see the before the GST is introduced we had uh, uh, demonetization or node bandi and that has happened in the November of 2016 and beyond that there is it's happened around the fourth quarter of 2015-16 the growth was slowing down and when the GST is introduced in the first quarter of 2017-18 the growth rate was 5.6 percent then it's picked up so at latest data that I have from the EPWRF and it is growth is around 8 percent kind of thing. So we could say that the, whatever the distortion happened before the introduction of note bandi and the, after the uh, note bandi that has been somehow we managed through the GST introduction it didn't uh, cause much distortion till now but what is going to happen in future I don't know. So that, with that note, I want to look into the most of the uh, demand side. So it's that what are the factors that influencing the uh, this GDP growth? So first thing comes the uh, private final consumption expenditure because that constitute almost 56 percent of our total uh, thing. And if we uh, uh, consider that, that since GST is a consumption based tax and mostly the people are consuming so what happened to the public finance private final consumption expenditure so if we see that after GST is introduced it was almost flat for three quarters in the fourth quarter it picked up so we are hopeful that the green suits could be seen in the private final consumption expenditure and what are the reasons for this kind of flatness and then picked up so and this pickup is basically very very preliminary or we are going to have a very soft that is another aspect of that thing and the two major factors which influence this kind of uh, thing is one is the of course the uh, petroleum products the diesel and petrol prices picked up and it picked up for last quite uh, of course eight quarters or nine quarters even last three four years it is picking up and it is picking up the prices is gone up much more for the diesel as compared to petrol which influence our diesel car sales if you see the car sales data the most of the big ticket item that the GST will come from 28 percent tax rate on the cars the car sales of the diesels have fallen down because the price difference between the petrol and diesel is going very down and the second thing is I want to mention is that the car sales for the long time is not picking up so we are hopeful that in the next uh, December this December end and uh, uh, we'll have huge uh, kind of uh, um, uh, kind of uh, incentives for the consumers to purchase cars because we are also talking about the slowly going to the electric vehicles so most of the people those who, who are want to take the polluting vehicles they will purchase the cars in December or January kind of thing the, with that and the, I want to go to the second part of the gross fixed capital formation that is the investment that is the engine of growth for future growth of our economy so if we see that after the GST is introduced they picked up the gross fixed capital formation investment picked up then it fall in the uh, first quarter of 2018 uh, 19 so reason for this kind of quote that most of the cases of what happened the long time there is a shortfall in the uh, investment private the uh, kind of government as well as private investment private investment was very slow because they are not certain what is going to happen in the GST and that thing they are holding for uh, not to have large kind of investment and second thing government investment was slowing down because of different reasons I uh, and then the, the government investment also picked up in that sense so but it 
fall down. So my hope is that if the investment is going down in the first quarter of 2018-19 and this chain continues for another two, three quarters, we will going to have very uh, bad time in terms of growth impetus for our GDP growth. And the third thing that I want to com uh, comment on final government final consumption expenditure is not picking up. Government final consumption expenditure is also not picking up and it's not a very weak uh, percentage but it's had, it is one of the major uh, items in our GDP growth uh, influence and if it is, if doesn't pick up and we are hopeful that if the Ayushman Bharat is introduced in the uh, this year or uh, even that kind of thing, there will be some kind of government final consumption expenditure, I don't know, I, I was just listening to Ayushman Bharat and other things, I thought that I will also pick some words about Ayushman Bharat, but that there is no, I don't see any government big ticket item is coming in government final consumption expenditure in the next couple of quarters. The third thing is basically is the export, export is almost flat for the last uh, three quarters, then it picked up in 2018-19, it may be that the petroleum prices uh, picked up uh, and that's why it is picking up but the thing is that export is zero rated so we are not going to get any tax revenue from the uh, export but the thing is that if export goes up our employment goes up our income goes up and people will consume so there's a possibility of the consumption growth and through that we will get the GST revenue and the import we are going to have uh, import is flat for the last three four quarters so the IGST part uh, from the import side we are, don't get too much of revenue from uh, expectation from that thing so with that scenario I could say that uh, ma, ma, that scenario is uh, very early scenarios are not very uh, bad and there are possibility that GDP growth will pick up over the years and since this is the next, uh, this, uh, we are going to have an election year, there will be lots of expenditure and there is a possibility of uh, GDP growth will pick up for the next year and inflation will be also moderated because it's an election year is coming. So with that note, I want to just point it out, there is another part of gross capital formation that is the change in stock. So if we plot the change in stock over the years, we'll see there's a huge fall in the change in stock. And this has happened before the GST is introduced. So we know that whenever the someone is holding the stock, that is also holding the tax. Because tax is only credited when you sell, when your sales liability arises, you adjust with your input tax credit. So this fall in the stock, that means there's a, basically the stock of input tax credit that government used to get that has gone down. So there's a possibility of label adjustment in the GST revenue and that revenue it will be around five to six, six thousand crore and that is the thing. And what is the possibility of kind of uh, why this has happened? There are several reasons for that stock adjustment but if you see in the market so one thing happened because that IGST rate and the CST rate. CST rate was 2%, IGST rate is around 18%, 12%, whatever the, the good uh, attract. So this is a huge tax blocking, basically the cash flow blocking if you store lots of uh, your goods into your uh, inventory. So there is a possibility that people don't want to stock goods and that's why the market uh, is having low uh, new normal level of stock holding. So with that I just want to conclude that this part uh, that the manufacturing, if we come to the uh, other uh, the sectoral aspect and that thing, manufacturing growth is picking up, there's a good sign, the after fall in the manufacturing growth before introduction of GST and that is quite uh, normal that manufacturing growth will be very low before the introduction of GST because people are not certain that what kind of tax rate is going to happen and what kind of input tax credit they will get, what will be the compliance and that thing. So there is lots of uncertainties when the GST is introduced and after that the manufacturing growth is picking up.
then also the one thing that I want to mention that uh, that uh, sir can uh, uh, give throw some lights to me because the earlier what used to happen that lots of value addition used to happen beyond manufacturing because manufacturing used to attract both central excise as well as that, uh, state tax, sales tax and VAT, whatever. But so lots of value addition, mainly in the paint sector, for the chemical sector, lots of value addition ha used to happen beyond the manufacturing level, trade sector. And maybe those are consolidating into the manufacturing sector. So if we see that the manufacturing growth is picking up, but the trade sector growth is not picking up. So the, and the trade, not only the trade, trade is the major uh, component of our service sector. So trade is not doing well as far as the data. So that is, a, uh, is a quite problematic. Why it is happening? I don't know. And that is to be explained in greater details. And other factor is basically agriculture sector is growing well. There's a possibility is that agriculture sector doesn't attract any taxes, even the purchase. Uh, food gain purchase tax and other tax are done, but that holds lots of input tax credit, fertilizer, pesticides, and all these things attract the taxes. And if the agriculture sector goes up, then of course your tax collection will go up. And the second thing is that agriculture sector improves. That means your demand for consumption good will improve over the years. And the last thing is that I want to mention that what has happened to Indian construction sector after GST introduced. Indian construction sector is going through a very bad uh, time before introduction of GST, but after introduction of GST there is improvement and after that in the first quarter of 2018-19 there is a fall. So there are reasons for that kind of thing. So one thing happened is that that real estate sector for the last two, three years, not doing well. So what construction sector is happening? Mostly in the government sector and the big road construction and other kind of activities. Not in the private uh, household sector construction activities. So, inflation. This is a good thing that Indian GST didn't is not inflationary. I, we can say by the uh, for the last five quarters data is not inflationary, in the sense that there is a high kind of inflation rate is moderated. Is not very inflationary. So there is two aspect of that thing. One is that if inflation rate is not high, and if we have four percent uh, target of achieving the inflation, so what level of our real GDP growth is required? to meet the 14% growth target that we have given for the state government because we have to, the central government have to give the for, uh, compensation to the state government by 14% growth rate with the base year of 2015-16. And inflation rate is not uh, very high, around 4 to 5%. That means if it is a 10% growth rate is required in our GDP growth. That's the one issue that what will be the union finances if the inflation rate is not very high. That's the one thing and even the CPI inflation uh, is not very high. So that is the second thing that I want to say. So in the winding up I could say that the trends in the growth and inflation in India seem to be somewhat different from the observed tendencies of other international experience and it didn't, I say that with the experience of the first five quarters that is not distortionary in that sense GST and it has helped somehow to overcome the distortion happened due to the note bandi. With that I want to show that how uh, difficult it is to GST system to compliance. So one of the two, uh, two indicators I have built, two, three indicators. So one is that the basically is uh, non-compliance and the late compliance and the compliance, so basically late fee. This is the data I gathered from uh, some website, is the RTI data. So if you see that the non-compliance, basically the non-filers have gone up. But this data is to be taken with uh, consideration that over the years these people, like the last February and January, they will file the return uh, after some time with late fee. 
and the late fee, uh, basically late compliance has gone down substantially. But the uh, late fee has gone up. So late fee for return submission, because you know we have GSTR1 submission and GSTR3V submission every month for the big. And then I don't want to uh, in discuss on other details of GST compliance system. So this is the thing is happening. That means 804, 14 rupees, every filing of return. So they want to pay the late fee and file the return. That means the, the compliance system is very costly for some of the uh, uh, registered dealers. The second thing of indicator of that thing, uh, that how who uh, com uh, cumbersome is the compliance and how difficult the system is that we have disputes there are 14 cases that have uh, uh, in the supreme court that have escalated to the supreme court and there are almost 118 cases and this is for only seven months this is only up to 16 march 2018 we have 180 cases in the high courts and 14 cases in the Supreme Court. So that means they are going to have lots of litigation in the GST system. So that is one kind of indicator that the GST system, I don't want to comment that is a litigation prone or not. So there is the possibility of simplicity of the GST system and that is to be explored. And the another way of avoiding the um, uh, GST litigation is to have advanced ruling. So some states, if we see, they prefer the advance ruining in, uh, as compared to uh, going to the litigation. So advance ruling, there are 110 advance ruling up to 8th August 2018 uh, the, has been issued. And advance ruling is the company specific and the issue specific. It is not general. So if I want to go for one product or specific thing, I want to get. It is not across the board that they can apply. So advance ruling is the one way to avoid the litigation and I hope some states uh, are most pro prone to advanced ruling as compared to go to disputes. Revenue side, I have just compiled, I hope if you could put up some lights then you can see this uh, table. So this is for four states that they, they have put the data and this data uh, they put to the addition, uh, joint secretary in the Ministry of Finance every month or every uh, quarterly to get the compensation. This data is available for the, all the states, but they don't put into the public domain. So some states they put, so if we see the, how the revenue figure is coming for the four states, so if you see the uh, case of Tamil Nadu, they have 8.2% growth in the GST collection. For the case of Odisha, they have negative growth and Maharashtra they have 29.5% growth and Kerala they have 4.02% growth in the GST collection. So if this revenue train continues then, then it would be a problem. Then I could speculate that what is going to happen after five years of GST, growth, GST compensation period is over after five years. So after this uh, Kerala fire the Kerala government is asking for 10% additional says uh, permission. So Tamil Nadu after Cyclone Gaja they are asking. So stability of the GST structure and design is in question because if this uh, continues and how, I don't know how 15th Finance Commission will come out with this problem of compensation to the states. Whether this compensation will be extended for another five years, whether union government has that much of fiscal pace, if not how to mitigate this problem. The union finances, if we see, we have put two uh, graph. One is without adjustment for IGST, another one with adjustment of IDT, IGST. That is 2017-18 corrected. I have allocated the 50% IGST to the state and 50% to the central government. And they have taken entire IGST to the central government. So that's the uh, uncorrected figure of 2017-18. If we see that as compared to 2015-16-17 monthly collection of uh, uh, GST revenue is, is lower than earlier periods. My 
is the back of the envelope collection uh, uh, estimation shows that ideally it will be around 1 lakh 10,000 crore every month to give 14% growth rate to the state government and intact the central government taxes and that thing. But if it is below 1 lakh 10,000, there will be deficit. And this year, this month, the last month we have 97,000 crore. So you can imagine that how much revenue shortfall we have. So with that, I just want to conclude, and conclusion is put in your uh, uh, folder, some of these things, that I want to just mention that one thing that GST is evolving. Uh, we can't say that uh, how these things will be after one or uh, two or three quarters or after, say, after one year. If the growth rate is good, I think then revenue will come. But there is a possibility of uh, simplicity of the GST system rate, uh, I think government is not going to touch the rate for another one or two years, but there is a process of simplicity, compliance, uh, enhancement, compliance, um, uh, taxpayer services, and other things. With that, I want to conclude. Thank you very much for your patience. <clears throat> Sir, the jury is still out. The <laughs> The data is insufficient and there are, uh, I mean, there are interpretations possible on the data that is available with us. And, and what is more, it might look that in order to provide 14% compensation to the states and a short rate of 14% compensation to the states, the center would need, I mean, the total GST collection including CES should be at an average level of around 1,10,000 crore. Against this background, let us consider one thing, that, that uh, the base year, in the base year, the aggregate value of taxes subsumed, center and states put together, was around 8,40,000 crore. An average of about, average is again a very dangerous idea, but uh, still, we would use this. An average of 70,000 crores a month in 15-16 of subsumed taxes. Now it's up to about 95,000, 96,000 crores, which is about an average of about 12.5%, 12% per annum. Not bad considering that we have introduced a tax in which we have had to virtually get 37 players on board. We, the, the entire system, the, this kind of tax, this is the only dual GST in the world. Every GST, every other GST in any federal structure, I don't need to tell you this, Dr. Rao knows this more than any of us. It's a unitary, essentially unitary in character. We are the only ones who are doing a dual GST. Brazil? and the province of Ontario and Canada also have state come central GSTs. But what the Canadians have done is that they have harmonized that. They have one levy, they have one administration. And let us not talk about the Brazilian levy because it's not only federal, not only provincial, it's a, it's a heady cocktail of federal, provincial and municipal in some cases also. Come again? You cannot say the Indian tax is unique. Uh, well, we can we can discuss it offline. There are other unique features. We can we without occupying the time of uh, all our distinguished faculty and members here. We can Absolutely. take it up later on. But sir, the jury is still out. We can't say that this sector has been hit badly. That sector has been hit badly. One thing that has come out very clearly is that the compliance level or the compliance expected has gone up. But considering the fact that in the one year period after GST introduction, a total number of 377 notifications or orders or circulars were issued, which makes it an average of more than one a day, I don't think we, we can make any conclusion. Nevertheless, uh, the floor is open. Hello. 
Sochi, I enjoyed the presentation and I learned a few things. I just want to, not for your reply, I just want to make two, three uh, quick comments on some things in your paper. Now, you uh, have used uh, this, uh, what do you call it, late returns filed uh, and penalties thereon as a basis of your estimate for compliance cost. But then you go on to relate the uh, present information on two other items, both of which will have a bearing on compliance cost. One is uh, uh, cases filed due to disputes. And second is uh, advanced rulings applied for. Advanced rulings can be, have a positive or a negative effect on compliance cost. Okay, so you need to find, think of a way of combining all three statements at least, but your idea of using late fees paid is innovative. So the uh, second related point is, uh, and that also relates to your following table on the finances of four states. It's heartening to note that one, you are comparing the pre-GST regime to the post-GST re regime, and you've done this for both center in one table, and, uh, and in the states in one table, and the center in a graph. Um, this, if you could extend this to a, a, short, a short time series, that would permit us to make valid comparisons between what's happening at the center, uh, 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 to central revenues and what's happening to state revenues. Okay, by itself, interest. Uh, at the moment, uh, even after looking at your, your table for states and hearing a story about the center, IGST uh, revenue reporting, I still have not a clue as to whether post-GST we're doing better or worse in terms of revenue collection and in terms of uh, the compliance cost with the GST, has that gone up or down? And uh, I, I was personally yesterday very negative, but I believe it's important to take into account in some way, not captured here, the compliance aspect, compliance with the GST. Thank you. I don't want to sort of be harsh. You know, you have been my colleague. But I'm somewhere lost. You know, the basic principle of analysis that we are supposed to do is association is not causation. Everywhere you are doing some association and then directly or indirectly attributing it to GST. You start with the price change, you start with the, you know, sort of um, GDP, you, and then, you know, go, you know, you go into, uh, you know, go into, you know, sector-wise thing. I'm not, you know, I mean, things could have changed for a variety of reasons. You know, before GST, you had uh, the demonetization. And there have been a lot of, there is a lot of base effect in many of these things because, you see, during the devaluation, some of the sectors have actually, you know, were, were badly hit. And in the first quarter of last, uh, you know, so for this year, you know, we had a 8.2% GDP growth and that's mainly because of the, because of the, the Bezier, Bezier uh, problems. Be, because of the, the, the low base. Now, I want you to, I mean, and we need to be a little more rigorous if you really want to get into, at least from NIPAP, I'd expect that. Association is not causation, and that's not something which I will take. You know, you're talking about GDCF, private consumption. I mean, you know, I mean, anything could have moved, including the, the population of cows. You know, I don't know, I mean, what you're talking about. Now, as far as compliance is concerned, I think it's too early to say, number one, as, I mean, you also have to say, I mean, in fact, the newspaper reported that now compliance is something like do, doing compliance is a 20,000 crore industry. You know, I mean, people have to go to a chartered accountant willy-nilly. I mean, they have to really give the money. I mean, that they, chartered accountants will have to do it earlier. You know, I'm, I'm basically saying, but we don't really have sufficient evidence to conclude anything. That's the point. Now, let us take that GST is a work in progress. And you will have to say what are things that we need to do in order to correct that. What will happen in five years? Many things may change. You know, we don't know. 
and then you do it, uh, and then I, you know, I mean, and then this, even in terms of the numbers, when you are coming to state-wise, IGST allocations, I am told, have been purely ad on ad hoc basis. I, I don't think GSTN is still functional in a manner, that is the reason why both exports, you know, even the export uh, in the refunds and then, uh, you know, sort of IGST allocation to state is on the basis of some formula. Sir, no, sir. Sir, uh, if you uh, allow me to intervene, sir, because I was a part of this process. Actually, the returns that are being filed, the 3B returns that have been summary returns, they have figures which are not validated through other returns. That is one thing. But the issue is that if I file a return and I say that this is the amount of SGST or CGST credit that I have claimed for paying off my IGST liability, then this is the amount that goes to that particular state. It is picked up from the return. This has to be one reconciled. Thing, sir. Reconciliation sir, one has to be done. Sir? Reconciliation has to be done. Definitely, sir. So people will have paid without really insisting. Sir, reconciliation will have to be done on two, two levels. One is that when I have made a claim in my return, then that has to be validated. Whether he, he, I claim to have purchased yeah, from that's, him. That's precisely so that the reason. Thing, that's the precisely reason I said GS validation has to ha happen with the GSTN. Obviously, that is the clearinghouse mechanism. Yeah. The GSTN is GSTN is still in is is, is also a work in progress. You know, and that's precisely the reason. You know, what I am trying to say is that it's too early for anything to say and. You know, why I am saying this is, you know, you have a situation where Maharashtra, it grows, grows on 19%. In Orissa, it goes negative. It's a, you know, I mean, you see, it, it, one, we are basically dealing with a few months' data. No, sir. Sorry, I, was, I just want to intervene that this is the final data that has put up in the Orissa and... Uh, uh, that, that I, thing, I, and it is a revenue uh, compensation they want to get. I am not taking any three months or four months data. I am sorry. And the second thing is no, that... one year data is only for, for only since January, July. It's only for a few months. One more thing I would like to... Food for thought for the likes of you, sir. GST being a consumption-based tax, it was expected that the so-called consumer-driven states like Bihar, Orissa, maybe UP to an extent, and other droves of other central Indian states would have gained a lot. They would not have had any need for any compensation. And the ones who really lost out on GST were the ones like Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka. Sir, what has happened is that Maharashtra is galloping. You've seen this. Tamil Nadu is picking up. The ones who are lagging behind, who fell behind, but they are now also picking up initially, were the states like Bihar, Orissa, the, the so-called consumer states, which were supposed to have benefited out of this. So there are many reasons for you this. No, no. There are, sir, the but assumption, it is for you itself, to find out, sir. Assumption itself was wrong because, you know, you, know, you did not take into account the fact that the service sector is predominantly in the, in the advanced states. I mean, you are giving a, additional taxation of services to them. Anyway, but the, the point is that, you see, I'm, I'm not sure that we can have firm conclusions. This is the point that I'm trying to say. And on the basis of this, you know, this will happen, that will happen. I mean, I, I think it's too early for me to say. And as far as your association is concerned, to, yeah. I, think, I think you need to do a little more rigorous work rather than yeah. simply saying, this, this has also increased, that has also increased, or, I mean, that's not all. <laughs> So, sir, I have to answer anything? So, no, I, 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 I really thank Dr. Mukherjee for having made an attempt towards trying to associate certain variables to certain elements, and I am sure he will develop it into a full blown theory. Thank Thanks, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee, for the talk. I request Dr. Sunita Lal to kindly hand over the mementos to the delegates. We also thank uh, Shri Mishra ji for chairing the session and keeping track of time. Thank you, sir. We have now come almost to the end of the program, we are, uh, to the validatory session. May I now request Professor Prabhat P. Ghosh, 
Director, Asian Development Research Institute, Patna, to kindly chair the validatory session of the day. It's also my honor to please invite Professor M. Govind Rao, Chairperson, Academic Advisory Committee, Center for Economic, uh, Economic Policy and Public Finance, to come to the dais. I request Professor Ghosh to please conduct the session. Thank you. Friends, I am extremely glad that you have finally come to the validating session of this two-day seminar. Uh, quite consciously, we had kept Professor Govind Rao as the speaker on this validating session. Dr. Shaibagal Gupta, while giving his welcome address, has already introduced him as the last word on public finance in India. So I only reiterate that same uh, description of Professor Rao, and we all look forward to his validatory lecture on, on uh, restoring the credibility of the budgets as all of us know who are working on the public finance, this is one of the most critical areas on which all the state governments and the central government must be working. Professor Rao. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, friends, I think uh, I, I really admire your patience, having sat through two very long hours in two days, and, and ultimately we'll have to come to this question of credibility of budgets and how do you improve it. So I'd like to thank all of you. Still quite a few of you are here, because many people possibly have lost patience. I have, must have gone home. <laughs> I mean, if I had the choice, I also, I also would have done that. <laughs> now, um, so let me thank uh, Shaibal, thank uh, Dr. Ghosh, thank uh, his team uh, who have been putting, you know, human uh, service, a lot of work uh, during the last few days in getting everything in place. Um, you know, they have used, I'm only namesake here, but all the work was done by them. I'm also like one of, one of your, like one of the participants. Uh, let me begin by saying that, um, you know, budget exercise has been attracting a lot of attention from everybody, particularly at the union level when the budget happens, it becomes a festival for the, the television sets. And everybody, whether he knows the budget or not, is, a, is an expert. Although the government, um, I mean, of course, now what's happening is that I think the government has already started preparing the budget. Whether they are going to present the full year budget now, or full budget now, or whether they are presenting a vote and account, we will have to see as we go along. But uh, there is already a lot of speculation that, uh, you know, on February 1, what will happen? There is much concern that there would be slippages in the fiscal deficit targets. Newspapers have been writing about it. Um, and of course, the finance minister has gone on to assure, saying that he is going to stick the fiscal deficit target. But at the same time, there is also a report saying that he will also follow the age-old ways of handling it. That really brings in a lot more of questions. How is going to handle it? Now, the fiscal deficit is um, estimated to be 3.3 percent this year, but uh, the market says that there it will be somewhere about 3.5 percent. The shortfall in GST collection, because you see they had assumed a GST collection of more than one lakh crore every every month. The shortfall in GST collection is estimated at about uh, 50,000 crore. That's for the center. And uh, disinvestment revenue could fall short of, um, you know, uh, by 
you know, they, they have 80,000 crore, but then they say that it might fall short by about 20%. But then recently I heard a, a news item, I read a news item which saying that either the PFC will buy out REC or REC will buy out PFC and will give the money to the government. That is the disinvestment. <laughs> now, on the expenditure side, um, additional subsidies for oil and fertilizers, the subsidy element has already been crossed substantially. And um, though thankfully lowering of the price of crude oil uh, will limit the damage, but then there will be uh, you know, there will be sub significant hike in oil uh, subsidies, fertilizer subsidies, and um, because of the MSP revision, there will be increase in food subsidies. Um, it is estimated that there will be an additional expenditure of about 20,000 crores on account of uh, new minimum support prices, as I mentioned, and additional 20,000, uh, maybe 2,000 crores uh, for Air India they have to give, uh, over and above the 16,300 crores they have already given. And additional expenditures will also have to be provided for uh, Aishman Bharat, though it's, we are still starting roll, it, uh, rolling out. And um, the speculation is that there will be some, you know, so there will be slippages, but Finance Minister, as he has already assured, he will follow the time-tested ways of adjusting. <laughs> I mean, let me put it this way. You know, history of uh, fiscal management in India is replete with uh, instances of slippages. And managing is, uh, time, you know, as it, in time tested, it has become time tested. Managing, ma managing the fiscal deficits has become a practice. You know, we are not correcting the fiscal deficit. We are not making a fiscal consolidation. We are managing it. You know, we do have something like a 8 to 10 year cycles in fiscal deficit. What happens is that every time there is a pay commission award or every time there is a oil price hike, I mean it happens somewhere about, you know, around 8 to 10 year cycle. You know, you had it in 1980s, you had it in the 1991, thanks to Saddam Hussein invading Kuwait and, and the problems there arising thereof. Of course, it's a problem was basically carried through the, you know, sort of very high expenditures that were incurred in the latter part of uh, the 1980s when uh, you know Rajiv Gandhi was the Prime Minister. Now then I mean when 98-99 come you have again the same set of problems. Then um, again after 2008-9 you have the similar set of problems. So some sort of a 10 year cycle you have and of course um, in fact you see the constitution makers, as well as the initial people in the initial listing itself, itself they had fear that there would be a problem like this. Now, in fact, uh, estimates committee, public accounts committee, and the Reserve Bank of India have been saying since 1957 that statutory regulation should be put on public debt. They wanted a separate statutory limitation to be put on public debt. But uh, government of India in its wisdom has never accepted them. Now, as I mentioned, um, after the 1991 crisis, we had a fiscal deficit of close to 10%. And then when it came to 97, 98, again, pay commission award and close to 10%. And, um, and then, of course, that led to the introduction of um, FRBM. Um, the discussion went on in 2000, and there was a committee under EAS Sharma um, which rec made a recommendation in 2002 and then which first basically made a recommendation that every, you know, you should reduce the fiscal deficit by 0.33% and then revenue deficit by 0.5% to reach, um, you know, uh, to reach uh, uh, fiscal deficit of 3% in 2006 and eliminate the revenue deficit. That was the first, this thing. Of course, the 12th Finance Commission came in and then gave the recommendation that uh, uh, you know, you should have the overall fiscal deficit of 6% of GDP, 3% for the center, 3% for the state, state. Basically, based on their assumptions, their, their projections, if I may say, uh, their projections about uh, household sector financial savings. 
basically this is the amount of fiscal space that is available 4% if you give to the 4% of space you give to the private sector you know the total household sector financial saving was about 10% of GDP 1.5% was the current account deficit they said 1.5% is needed for the the public sector enterprises and if you have to give 4% fiscal deficit 4% space for the private sector you were left with 6% so 3% for the center 3% for the state that is the logic that was given by Rangarajan and his group in the 12th Finance Commission. Now this has gone on and um, of course they wanted the revenue balance to be achieved. They gave a very liberal sort of uh, incentive to the states to adjust it to 3%. And so then what happened is that things happened very well you know, in the early part of 2000, after 2003-2004, mainly because of the very sharp increase in the income tax revenue. And this sharp increase in income tax revenue, on an average 32% per year from 2003-2004-2005 to 2007-2008. And that happened because of the tax information network, TIN. <coughs> I do not want to go into the details for want of time. But basically what the controller and auditor general had told at the time, I mean made a recommendation, uh, made a, a report that many of these people who are supposed to deduct the tax at source and file the return, never file the return. They deducted the tax at source, kept it for themselves, didn't give the pay the money to the government. And it's under, under this, Vijay Kelkar was the advisor, he, you know, sort of set up this tax information network with the NSDL as the, uh, the partner. The result was significant, 32% per year increase. That and the expansion of the service tax base, these are the two reasons, you know, they were able to adjust. But came 2008-9, after 2007-9, everything was fine. Came 2008-9, you have a problem. The election year, and in the election year, you know, there is something called electoral budget cycles. There were three major decisions that were taken. Implementation of Pay Commission Award, expansion of National Rural Employment Guarantee from 200 districts to the whole country, and loan waiver, a massive loan waiver program. The result was a complete, a complete disequilibrium in the entire scheme of things. And uh, they had, Chidambaram had budgeted for a deficit of 2.5, fiscal deficit of 2.5 percent, and uh, by July, by the time we came to July, the oil prices increased to $165 a barrel. Election year, they were not willing to increase the prices of uh, distillates. The, the, that year, we ended up, at the central level alone, we ended up a fiscal deficit of close to 8%. And then onwards, we have been struggling. So the finance ministers come and say that I will pause here, I will change here. You know, there are lots of creative accounting that has, uh, that has uh, gone on. And then, obviously, they could not meet the target because they were supposed to reach the target in 2008-9, the 3% fiscal deficit target. Then they shifted the target and the 13th Finance Commission said that by 2014-15, you should arrive. The things have continued. Because, and then, of course, the 14th... 14th, you know, uh, the, the, that is the 13th commission, the 14th commission also came up and then gave the, the recommendation. And then, of course, in the meantime, they have a fiscal uh, uh, FRBM review committee under, uh, you know, Mr. N.K. Singh, which has also made its recommendation by 2022, you have to face out the fiscal deficit. So we have been actually moving. The things have been going on. Uh, the, the shifting... You know, we keep shifting the goalposts, as, may, as, as may, I may say. Um, one of the important things that the 13th Finance Commission made is that the FRBM process should be more comprehensive and transparent because they have seen that lots of changes were being made. He said it should be made more comprehensive and transparent, sensitive to exogenous shocks, and should have a mechanism for monitoring and compliance. And, um, and then they put out a number of recommendations, saying that you, say you should have, you know, I mean, you know, they, 
you know, they created a concept of effective revenue deficit and said that the money that they spend on Narega will be for, you know, is for capital purposes because they are creating assets and therefore it should be considered as a cap, you know, it, is a, it should not be considered as a revenue expenditure, etc. I mean, in fact, the, the very interesting thing is that, you know, after all these, there is a Control and Auditor General's report for 2015-16, which was laid in the Parliament in December 2017. And that makes very revealing things. I mean, apart from various other mistakes that they made, including misclassification. For example, rural housing project or urban housing project, you know, you say that it is effectively capital expenditure. But you are actually giving money to the states. States are not doing the capital expenditure. States are giving it to the third party. And since they are giving it to the third party, I mean, how can you say that you have a capital expenditure? I mean, there are issues of that nature, you know, technical nature that have been raised, but then there are more substantive issues for which I will come to. <coughs> now, <coughs> because when uh, <coughs> we, at the state level, when, when we were looking at things, you know, you have a peculiar problem. You have finances of Tamil Nadu, which are in a very sound case. But then you look at their power sector, it is a basket case. You look at the finances of West Bengal, it's pretty bad. Look at their power sector, it's shining. Now, the point is that, that's basically the point that I'm trying to make. You need to make things comp you know, comprehensive. So in the 14th Finance Commission, we said that, you see, we should have an extended definition of debt and de extended debt and deficit including at least the power sector things in, into, the, into the scheme of things. Because power and transport are the two major enterprise, you know, enterprises of the, the state governments. Now, let me come to the, the speci some specifics. As I said, uh, history of official management of fiscal management in India as is replete with instances of uh, all sorts of wrongdoing, if I may say. Um, there are pressures on the governments on both revenue and expenditure sides. Uh, so, not surprising in the forthcoming vote and account or budget, the finance minister resorts to a lot of window dressing and creative accounting. When the estimate itself is questionable, you know, I mean, I'll come to how, why it is questionable, the whole deficit question itself is, question, is questionable. We are talking about whether 3.5 to 3.2, 3% will come some decimals. Do they matter? You know, I have a much more serious issue with regard to the fiscal deficit question, which I will come to. In the past, the failure to adhere to fiscal targets was only a part of the problem. We have always redefined the targets. Shifting the goalposts from time and again, making existing, compressing the growth, uh, compressing growth enhancing expenditures and resorting to creative accounting. Because you cut down, you know, when, if you want to cut down, you cut down on the capital expenditures and then, you know, basically, you know, they are the growth enhancing expenditures. You cut them down and create your accounting, as I already mentioned, you have a new concept of uh, effective revenue deficit. And it is also a usual practice to postpone the payment of bills. Much more serious are the attempts to obfuscate the forecast of revenues and expenditures. In fact, the problem starts from there. Because, you see, in the, you know, for example, in the, in the note and vote and account that he will present, he will say that, you see, I am going to read 3%. Now, what, what actually happens is after a year, you may monitor every month to month, but then he says, I will always make adjustment. The elections will be over. And then you said that I waited to the fiscal deficit. Can anybody question that? It will go on. <clears throat> so, create, taking advanced tax revenue, creating disinvestment revenues through inter-enterprise purchases. I did mention about, you know, yet peace, you know, ONGC buying HPCC and that becomes a disinvestment revenue. Did you ask the shareholders, the shareholders about what you are doing? LIC bailing, going and bailing out uh, uh, ILFS. Now 
there is a question of, um, um, as I said, Power Finance Corporation buying out uh, Rural Electrification Corporation and giving the money to the government saying that this is the disinvestment revenue. I mean, you, you know, this is basically trying to do a lot of... Uh, all these have serious adverse implications on the budget management. When you forecast the revenue much higher, and when it doesn't realize, and you have made allocation, you have announced the allocation to the various spending departments based on your high to, you know, sort of uh, overestimate of revenue. And as the time passes by, you simply cut them. Now, many of them would have started their programs and they can't complete, complete the programs in time. In fact, uh, as I said, 13th Finance Commission, after reviewing the experience of fiscal adjustment at the center, had underlined the need for actions to make union budgets under three categories. They, you know, you need to make them, as I mentioned, more transparent and comprehensive, sensitive to exogenous shocks, and improved monitoring and compliance. <coughs> as I mentioned, problem begins with uh, forecasting. You know, when you forecast an income tax revenue, you, you know, distribute the higher targets of the the uh, collect rates and the performance of uh, the officials will depend upon you know their their collecting higher revenue no irrespective of whether it is right or wrong they just go about slapping assessing much higher revenue than what is this thing now when you have the dispute you can go to the tribunal but you have to pay 50 percent of the tax now he is quite fine and he knows that it is going to be killed in the tribunal but it doesn't matter to him because, you know, his, he has been able to collect his, you know, reach his target. Now, if you look at Control and Auditor General's report on revenue last year, which is report number 40 on direct taxes, says that 65% of the cases in the tribunals, 79% of cases in the high courts, and 71% cases in Supreme Court are decided in favor of the SSEs. And when you have this happens, that means you just think, just worry about taxing them wrongly, now you have asked them to pay 50%, that of 50% you have got to pay the, the pay interest. And the interest amount that the government gives last year worked out to be 80,000 crores. Now these are things that we don't know. 80,000 crores is the interest the government pays for wrongly assessing the income tax. Now, now the report, uh, the FRBM compliance report talks about the unpaid bills. You know, something like one point, um, so, you know, something like 1.67 crores, 1.67 lakh crores is the amount of money that was not paid in 2015-16 uh, to Food Corporation of India, Fertilizer Corporation of India, and Fertilizer um, um, Food Corporation of India, uh, and then of course uh, oil companies and the fertilizer uh, and the fertilizer companies. One point, you know, that is the amount of money that you already, you know, you have incurred, but then you have not paid. One point something like one point six lakh crores, and another twenty seven lakh crores is the amount of money they did not pay to the states, their tax devolution. The tax devolution, which was a constitutional necessity, was not paid. Basically, the argument, the, they deal with the argument. The argument is that, you know, our calculations and your calculations are different. Who has to calculate? Is it the Control and Auditor General or the Department of Economic Affairs? But anyway, I mean, this is, they, they do point this out. So, 1.8, 11, 7, 8, seven lakh crores. Now, when you have this type of a thing, you know, we keep creeping about 0.2% of GDP, 3.3 or 3.5. What meaning does it have? Now, budget is a document um, translating government policies into actions. You need to restore the credibility and make it comprehensive, transparent and realistic and that is necessary. Measures like fixing the numerical targets, like you know, passing the FRBM Act, is only one part of the case, and that has not you know sort of succeeded in you know trying to discipline the centre. 
I mean, I'm having a rolling medium term fiscal framework. Now every year keep changing, you know, it doesn't matter. Parliamentarians don't discuss, discuss this issue, it's, it's a, become a common thing. Transparent and, transparency and significance are important. Now the 13th Finance Commission also recommended a number of measures like having a, a table on economic and functional classification, presentation of a separate statement on transfers to states, more scientific estimation and reporting of tax expenditures on, ma on tax expenditures on major tax concessions, working out and presenting compliance costs, and that's a huge job. And um, I, do, I mean, I think that's an unrealistic thing to tell the government to do it. Arindan Das Gupta is the only study in the country that has estimated the compliance cost, and he will tell you how difficult it is, and nobody tells you the truth. <laughs> You know, the industry people, they will complain a lot. But when it comes to that, you know, it's like in the case of GST. They may privately complain, but otherwise, oh, it's a game changer. I mean, they're all cheerleaders. Now, details of capital expenditure proposals of the, and their revenue consequences. Comprehensive assessment of contingent liabilities, including the liabilities arising from PPPs. All these have been pointed out, but no work has been done. You know, the very interesting part of the Finance Commission's exercise is that there are basic terms of reference, which is given in the Constitution itself. And there are these additional terms of reference, which is given as, you know, any other matter in the interest of finance. The basic terms of reference, they will make, a, you know, in the action taken report, they say that we are taking care. But the additional things, see, they just ignore it. They say that we will think about it as and when it is required. And invariably, they don't follow that. The question is, when the markets fail, governments have to intervene. How do we minimize the problems of government failure? What do we do when the governments fail? They repeatedly, if you say that, you know, I mean, you declare that you are going to contain the fiscal deficit, and ultimately you don't do it, you completely go on repeat, you know, changing the goalposts, changing the definitions, changing the, do the creative accounting, you resort to all sorts of uh, this type of thing, how do you deal with this problem? We need to create checks and balances in the system and that is the reason why we had a rule-based fiscal policy input in, put in place. Power, parliamentary oversight is important, but that is effectively done by the... You know, in, one of the things that has happened, at least in several countries, number of countries, particularly after the global financial crisis, is the introduction of what is called a fiscal council. In the US, you have... Uh, Congressional Budget Office. In UK, you have Office of Budget and Accountability. And you have, you know, uh, you know, many other countries have either parliamentary budgetary offices or fiscal councils. The predominant, predominant task of these, I mean, there are many things that they do. For want of time, I will not go into. But the three major things, tasks that they do is, one is they evaluate the forecast of the government as soon as the forecast comes in and tells that whether this forecast is right or wrong. In some countries, actually, fiscal councils do the forecast and that is taken in the budget. Okay? Now, at least, you see, you don't really create, a, you know, it's, it becomes, a, it's a neutral, ex this thing. At least people are told that this revenue forecast, expenditure forecast has these many assumptions. This is the problem. Second thing is the governments come and then simply go about making... Uh, you know, sort of announcements. On the rampart of the Red, red Fort, irrespective of which party is in power, the, the Prime Minister goes up and says that we are going to have such a this, that, a hundred other things. The announcement of schemes. Even when we talked about, you know, one rank, one pension, nobody knew what it was. Somebody has to cost these schemes. When you, when you, did, um, when you, when you did the Smart Cities project, has anybody defined what a Smart City is? What is a smart city? Now, you come up and then who is supposed to do center? And you say that the center that I will give you 200, 100 crores. The rest of it, you know, you will have to manage. You have to compete for that 100 crores. Many of them don't care. I mean, why should, uh, the, you know, be the Maharashtra Municipal Corporation Greater Mumbai with something like, something like a 14,000 crore budget why should we bother about 100 crore? I mean, 
you know you create that sort of a situation you give a 100 crore you want i mean but then nobody has worked out what would make us what is the cost of a smart city how much would the center give how much would the states give how much would the municipal corporation give there is no such thing so the second major job of the fiscal council is to whenever an announcement is made what would, would what it what is the conceptual part of it and how it, how much it would cost the third is monitoring the fiscal targets of the center and saying that look this is where what is happening from time to time they are supposed to report to the parliament but then the 13th finance commission's recommendation was that you should have a committee which will convert itself into a fiscal council and that fiscal council will be report will be appointed by the ministry of finance and reporting to the ministry of finance umpires cannot be players <laughs> and then comes the 14th finance commission which made a very clear recommendation saying that we do need a fiscal council and that should you should amend the FRBM Act and that should be appointed by the parliament reporting to the parliament. Nobody talks about it. It's only in the report. Not even, not even one sentence has been written. The FRBM committee and comes and says that oh we need a definitely a fiscal council. What is the fiscal council? The Ministry of Finance will appoint a council and it will be reporting to it. Yeah, the point that I'm trying to make is that, you know, I mean, I'm not for a moment saying that fiscal council is, is a, a silver bullet. It is not. If there is no political acceptability, acceptability, then obviously it will fail. And if there is a political acceptability, you don't need a fiscal council. <laughs> but this is something like, this is also something like, um, you know, FRBM. You know, you raise the awareness to the people that there is a fiscal council which is making this. Basically, you know, advocacy thing that it can do. And it can do, bring about certain amount of checks and balances. It is neither necessary nor necessary, nor uh, sufficient, but it can, it, it has to, it, it can be useful. Now, the other important thing is that many of the countries in the world, in fact, this is one of the agenda in the G20, that the countries have decided to move over to an accrual accounting system. Malaysia has given a very clear plan of moving into an accrual accounting system for three years. If you have an accrual accounting, you can't put this 1.87 lakh crores in, you know, next year and say that, look, I mean, I have balanced my budget. Now, unfortunately, you know, there, is, you know, there has been every finance commission has made this recommendation that move over to an accrual accounting system. That also you can manipulate. I mean, it's not that everything is free, but the point is that, you see, you know, it's difficult. Now, for some reason, the government of India just doesn't want to move over to an accrual accounting. Now, maybe after the G20 situation. Now, the point that I'm saying is that we all have to write and then say that, look, move over to an accrual accounting system, let us be a little more transparent. Now, we have this, uh, as I mentioned, um, we have this serious case of uh, government failure. We have a huge problem with the management of the fiscal deficit. And we do need to, you know, sort of uh, bring in some checks and balances in the system. And, um, you know, I mean, and there is no point in talking about one or two percentage, you know, decimals. And I think we need to have a, a much bigger reform of the budgeting system altogether. Thank you very much. Uh, friends, uh, I don't think we could have had a valedictory address more informative dean than what Professor Rao gave us. Thank you very much, Professor Rao. And thank you very much, Professor Rao. I'm sure many of you will have the questions. They may be based. That can be discussed with him. But since it's a validity address, we don't have questions in our sessions. Then I can answer. No, <laughs> we'll do that. Uh, friends, I'll take a short time before we close to propose a vote of thanks. To begin it, I first express our deep gratitude to the state government particularly the Department of Finance. 
You know, the Center for Economic Policy and Public Finance was established by them, uh, which means that they give us financial support. But what has been more interesting is that last 10 years, as well as in the recent past, they have not only given us financial support, they have given us all other kinds of support that a center like CPPM needs for functioning properly. During the inaugural session, we had the privilege of Honorable Deputy Finance Minister entering this session, as well as Dr. S. S. Siddharth, uh, Principal Secretary of Finance, coming here and attending our inaugural sessions. I am thankful to both of them. I am also thankful to state government in general, apart from the Department of Finance. You must have marked during the last two days, we had as many as six to seven principal secretaries coming here and joining our deliberations, both as the participants as well as chairpersons of different sessions. In particular, I'd like to name uh, C. Rahul Singh, C. Deepak Kumar Singh, C. Sanjay Kumar, C. Arvind Kumar Choudhury, and Mr. Arun Kumar Mishra, who is just sitting here now. Next, I'd like to thank uh, the scholars who have come here from all over the country as well as from outside the country. It will not be possible for me to take all the names, but I'd like to mention two names very specifically, that is Dr. Y.B. Reddy and Professor M. Gaminder Rao. Professor M. Gaminder Rao. Yes, I'm going to mention that. I'm going to mention that. Uh, in a sense, he doesn't deserve because of the, he is the principal architect of this whole, uh, whole uh, work, so he, has, he was visualized it. He has also given us enough of contacts to get the very best of resource persons for the seminar. Nevertheless, we still give you enormous thanks on our behalf. I am not naming other scholars who have attended this seminar, either as a lecturer or as a participants. Friends, uh, uh, next I have to thank uh, my colleagues at Adri. Again, that's a long list. I have been working for, we have been working for the last three months. It will not be possible to take all the names, but under the able guidance of Dr. Sunita Lal, three people who have done excellent work and relentless works is Dr. Niladri Dhar, uh, Mr. Kumar Das, and uh, Soumya, who is sitting here for the last two days. To thank you to all of them. Uh, this morning, if you have seen the paper, uh, our seminar was very widely uh, covered. So press has already taken note of us. I extend my thanks to press people also. I also thank the, hot the hotel, uh, Moria Hotel Management for giving us all the support that you need. With these words, I thank you all over again and hope... Oh, I see. Uh, uh, this seminar was partly supported by in, in, uh, in, in International Growth Center, and two of the sessions in this center, in center, one on agricultural finances that most of you attended, as well as another on health, was specially supported by uh, uh, IGC India and uh, Dr. Pranav Sen, who is heading the unit apart from Dr. Shaibal Gupta, who is heading the unit here, both of them here to give us. I'm a special thank to them. Anything? Oh. <laughs> uh, again, Professor Anjan Mukherjee's case is a, is a border case. I'm not sure whether to thank him uh, because he's outside coming from Delhi or he's part of Badri Hidan. Nevertheless, since he has given us enough of time, enough of support and enough of encouragement, my most thanks to Professor Anjan Mukherjee also. With these words, I thank you very much.